Good afternoon. Um, I'm Brad Wilson. I'm executive director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton. Uh, welcome, welcome back uh, to a new academic year at Princeton. This is the first uh, public event uh, that the Madison Program is sponsoring. I'll, I'll mention that next Tuesday uh, we have our second event, which is the Madison Program's Constitution Day lecture by the very distinguished historian Gordon Wood, uh, who will be lecturing on his new book, uh, Friends Divided on Adams and Jefferson's Relationship Over the Years. So I hope you'll come to that. That will be over in Bowen Hall. Today we have uh, an event, Speak Freely, Lessons from Middlebury and Evergreen State. We stole the title, Speak Freely, from a new book, uh, a new book written by uh, the gentleman to my left, Keith Whittington, uh, which uh, President Eisgruber has selected as the university's pre-read this year, which is a big deal. The pre-read is a text that uh, kind of uh, becomes a focus of conversation uh, and thought for the entire academic year for the Princeton community. Uh, this year, the book is being distributed to all Princeton students, not just the freshmen, as we've ordinarily done in the past, and to all faculty, which uh, indicates Professor Eisgruber's recognition of the centrality of this issue of freedom of speech on American campuses, and on this campus in particular, to what a university ought to be. So uh, we're pretty happy about that. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Whittington. Let me just mention that he is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics here at Princeton, where he's taught and uh, done his scholarship for many years now, the well-known in the field of constitutional theory, constitutional law, constitutional thought. Uh, I'm, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Keith Whittington to you. Keith. Thank you. Thanks for coming out um, early in our uh, semester. I'm still in denial that the semester has actually uh, begun yet. Um, uh, but uh, I think we're going to have a good conversation um, this afternoon. Um, about uh, free speech on campus and issues associated with uh, academic freedom. And we have uh, a very interesting group of people with a lot of firsthand experience of just how uh, badly things can go um, on college campuses regarding the free speech issue from uh, uh, two places um, that sort of erupted just as I was uh, working on the book, Middlebury um, and um, Evergreen State. Um, and so I look forward to um, hearing their uh, remarks uh, about um, their experiences and how it helps them think about about, uh, these free speech issues and then turning it over to you um, to get questions and comments um, as, as we uh, get there. So my hope is that we're going to be uh, relatively brief with opening remarks so that we're going to set things up and then as quickly as possible um, get to your um, questions and comments. So you should be uh, thinking about what it is uh, you might uh, want to say. Um, and so in the interest um, of getting us uh, moving along, uh, relatively expeditiously. Um, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce um, each of our speakers. So uh, from Millbury, uh, we have, um, to, to begin, uh, Allison Stanger, who is the uh, Russell Ling uh, 60 Professor of International Politics and Economics and the founding d director of the, I have no idea how to pronounce this, uh, Roatan Center? Yeah, you yeah, there you go. Of International Affairs um, at Millbury College. Um, uh, and uh, author of uh, numerous works, including uh, the forthcoming uh, Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Leaks, um, the story of whistleblowing in America, which Yale University Press uh, will be publishing. Um, after her, we'll go uh, Keegan uh, Callanan, uh, who's an assistant professor of political science at Middlebury College. Um, where he teaches in uh, political philosophy and political um, theory. Um, recently a, a fellow here at Princeton and in James Madison uh, program. We're happy to have him back on this occasion. Um, and then uh, we'll turn to uh, Evergreen State, uh, beginning with uh, Heather Hying, who is a scientist and educator and was a professor of evolutionary biology at Evergreen State College uh, for 15 years, um, where she worked on um, uh, 
evolutionary uh, biology and, and working with undergraduates um, to uh, think about um, those issues, and Brett Weinstein, who um, was also um, teaching in evolutionary biology um, at Evergreen State and uh, working on Darwinian frameworks uh, for uh, design trade-offs and making um, discoveries on the evolution of cancer um, and adaptive significance of moral uh, self-sacrifice. Um, so I'm very happy to have um, this group of scholars um, here with us to talk about um, not only their experiences, but trying to think about um, academic freedom issues uh, in our uh, contemporary situation uh, more generally. Um, and so let me begin with Professor Steiner. Well, thanks so much, and thanks for, for having me. It's great to be here during the first week of classes. Uh, I have warm memories of Princeton. My daughter uh, is a member of the class of 2017, and I met my husband at Princeton, so I like being here. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, are there any first years here present? Excellent, excellent. What I'm about to say is addressed totally to you. I want to apologize in advance if what I say offends you. <laughs> I mean this very ser seriously. If it does, I want you to tell me so and explain why, without resorting to an ad hominem attack. That is, I want you to say what you are thinking because I'm genuinely interested and I will do the same. That's the, the frame with which I'd like to start this discussion. I've been asked to give just a brief summary of what happened on the 2nd of March, 2017 at Middlebury, and I'm happy to do that. Some students from the American Enterprise Club, whom I greatly admire and respect, very bright students, invited Charles Murray to come speak on campus. They knew he was controversial, and so they wanted to do a slightly different format. They asked me if I would serve as moderator, but more than that, they wanted me to ask the first three or four questions. I took this job very seriously. I read everything. I had devastating questions. It was going to be a great, great exchange. But it never took place as planned uh, because students protested and shut down, basically shut down the speech. Um, there was an alternative plan we went to another room in the same building where we tried to webcast kind of an abbreviated exchange. That was hard to do because there were fire alarms going off. Uh, it was genuinely frightening. People were pounding on the windows. I, 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 it's not something I would recommend. It's not a good environment in which to think and listen. So we thought it was over after, after we got this webcast out of the way, it felt great. Unfortunately, when we left the building, we were surrounded by a, an angry mob, and um, I will say right here that that's been distorted in a lot of ways. I myself did not notice any students of color in that group. I noticed white people. That doesn't mean there weren't any, any because I don't remember much of it, so I don't know how <laughs> worthwhile that really is, but one of them pulled my hair, as another one body slammed me the other way, and I wound up uh, going to the emergency room after the dinner and was diagnosed at first with neck injuries, whiplash, and uh, subsequently two days later, I found myself driving on the wrong way of a street I had driven on for 25 years in Middlebury, went back to the hospital and found out I had a concussion. Then they retroactively decided that my neck injuries were whiplash because when we, when we left the building, it wasn't just that the mob surrounded us, but we got into a car and tried to get away and was stop it, slamming on the brakes, stopping and starting. And since a car was involved, they, then they can call it whiplash. I think that the getaway kind of exacerbated my, my injuries. So it's a horrible tale, um, not at all what I'd expected. Um, and what I'm gonna say to you is probably going to surprise you, but I actually see what happened to me as something of a gift. Now, that might, why, why do I say that? I say that because I don't have any regrets for what I did. I would do exactly the same thing over again. And I have learned so much through that experience and talking to people around the country about it and related issues concerning our country and our democracy that it's really deepened my empathy. I find that I can listen to music and enjoy music that I had never listened to before, which is sort of an interesting development. In short, I have an open mind about thinking ahead, and I think a Princeton education can give you that without injuries. 
<laughs> you don't have to go through what I went through to get an, have an open mind and be genuinely interested and empathetic in those you encounter. It's a deal, you should take it and make the most of your time here at Princeton. See, the thing is, shutting down speakers, in some ways, I think it's useful to think of it as an ideology that appeals to some radical students and professors, but we're talking about a minority here. I'm happy to tell you, I don't think it seems to permeate communities beyond the ivory tower. Yes, our country is polarized, and we can talk about that. Yes, people are encouraged to identify with particular tribes and find their identity in that. There's all kinds of problems in our country. I don't need to tell you that, but, but um, it's surprising to me that particularly in the middle of, when you get outside, you find a lot of like-minded people who want to listen to people who are different from them and learn from them, who want to build community, who want to have free and open exchanges. I'll give you just one example. I wrote a memo for a Princeton workshop that took place in February that was wonderful. Uh, I really thought it was extraordinary. You're quite fortunate to be at this university with the president that you have. We were talking about these sorts of issues in the academy, and I wanted to vet it with some people just to see how they might respond, some coworkers. You know, was what I was saying tone deaf in any way? And you know what's really funny? is I showed that to people who were going to catch me perhaps being toned up using the wrong language or something. And they just said to me, you know, Allison, I have read this three times. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even know what you're talking about. And it then it hit me. This whole thing about Charles Murray and the uproar on campuses is really something that's taking place in the academy. And ordinary people don't relate to it in the same sort of way. In other words, Afri African Americans in particular, black Americans, are facing far worse than the wrong sort of language in the real world. So what's the implication from that? I really think you can be a positive force in the fight against racism and injustice by simply thinking for yourself, encouraging others to do the same, and listening empathetically to those with whom you disagree. It sounds really simple, and it actually actually is. This is good for both the university and it's good for the country as a whole. The biggest thing I've learned, that is, is that I would put it this way. Bell curves don't matter. Individuals do. We can all, that is, model the behavior we want to see. So I would encourage you, moving forward, all of us, not just students, but the others in this room, to speak freely, as Professor Whittington urges us to do, and allow others to do the same. I would encourage you to be human. We're all humans. Humans make mistakes. Admit your mistakes when you make them, and allow others to do the same. And finally, open your mind and your heart, especially if you're those first-year Princeton students. Learn all you can starting now, and it'll be a lifelong journey, and it's going to be a beautiful ride for you. The bottom line is that both racism and some variants of anti-racism can operate as ideologies. What do ideologies do? They give you a roadmap for what you're supposed to think and feel that, in a sense, allows you not to think for yourself. That's really boring that is going to stand as an obstacle to your education. And so I would encourage you finally to think for yourself. And I'd put it this way, be a member of the tribe that hates the idea of tribes. Because that tribe is another word for Americans. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Whittington, for the introduction, and thanks to the Madison Program for hosting uh, today's event. I feel I stick out a little on this panel. I've never found myself in a neck brace for defending free speech on campus, although that's part of my professional development plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been exiled from, from a campus, but a boy can dream. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I'm honored to share this panel with uh, three scholars who sacrificed for the cause of free inquiry on campus. I talk about it, but you have actually incurred loss as a result of your defense of that value. And for that, all members of our guild ought to be grateful. Today, I appear not as an expert on this question of free speech on campus. It's not the subject of my research, and I'm, uh, so I'm not going to speak uh, in any authoritative way about the problem in its most general terms. But I'm going to try to limit myself to uh, lessons or insights gained from conversations, observations, and action surrounding the Battle of Murray, that is Charles Murray, uh, at Middlebury College in Vermont. Regarding the state of things at Middlebury, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that Middlebury is uh, not a campus peculiarly hostile to conservatives or cursed with a uniquely high degree of ideological conformism. That's the good news, it's also the bad news. Which is to say, Middlebury is not unique and the problems we've experienced cannot be comfortably set aside as the dysfunctions of one bizarre campus in Bernie land as some have attempted to do. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, Middlebury is ideologically homogenous, and leftist politics do often shape the curriculum. There is but one conservative under the age of 70 in the social sciences and humanities at Middlebury. If only we knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are even some professors who see their role as mobilizing for left-wing political causes rather than seeking the truth. They are uh, scholars in the same way that Al Capone was a beverage distributor. <laughs> but, but, but in this, uh, Middlebury is actually no different, I think, uh, than many of its peers. And that means that what happened at Middlebury should be a subject of concern at these other institutions as well. Now, I confess that I was honestly surprised by how difficult it was uh, to advance the cause of freedom of speech and, and free inquiry at Middlebury during and after the Charles Murray incident. And this surprise, I think, was shared by many of my senior colleagues, uh, as Allison, I think, just suggested. So I thought it might be useful to reflect on some of the considerable and non-obvious advantages that opponents of open inquiry enjoy in a conflict like uh, the Murray incident, and more broadly, in campus debates about free speech. I'll try to offer a little bit of insight into why the case for free speech on campus can be a heavy lift when it seems, or indeed I think is, uh, so intuitive to so many of you in the room, including uh, non-academics, and I dare say especially to non-academics. The first reason I think this is a difficult case to make is that the problem tends to be framed as a competition between two co-equal and incommensurable values, freedom of speech and inclusion or inclusivity. After the events at Middlebury, we had a faculty committee convened, and it was called the Speech and Inclusion Committee. Many of those who opposed robust, uh, free, the robust free speech position thought campuses need some kind of formal or informal mechanism to limit hate speech in order to ensure that everyone feels included in the community. Now, this idea that there is a genuine competition of core values leads many fair-minded colleagues to, view, uh, to the view that there must be some kind of compromise position or compromise policy that strikes a balance between these two values. And therefore, a robust Chicago or Princeton-style commitment somehow goes too far and is immoderate. What can be said about this idea that free speech and inclusivity are in tension? I've never been able to swallow this particular bromide. The mission of a college is the pursuit of truth, as Professor Whittington argues in the first chapter of his book. Truth-seeking requires freedom of inquiry. Freedom of inquiry is, and this is the crucial point, therefore constitutive of the meaning, the essential meaning or character of a college. So if you relax or compromise the principle of free inquiry in hopes of thereby including more people in the academic community, you have in fact changed the essential character of that community. Deploying the strategy of inclusion through censorship you don't actually include anyone in the college, but you rather include them in something of your own making, something qualitatively different from a college, a burlesque of a college. Inclusion through censorship is therefore, I think, an empty promise. Real academic inclusion, in its fullest sense, is inclusion in a community of truth-seeking through open inquiry. So this is the main reason I reject uh, the idea that there's any true tension 
as was so often articulated in the Middlebury case, between inclusivity and free inquiry. Students who are promised a more inclusive academic community by means of hard or soft censorship will find in the end that they've been sold a bill of goods. Theirs will be the experience of the boy promised a place in his father's high stakes poker game, only to find that once he arrives, the men begin playing go fish instead of poker, for bubble gum instead of cash. This changes the essential character of the activity. In fact, the boy is being included in something, uh, in, a, in some other activity altogether. Academic inclusion through censorship is, in this way, an, optic, an optical illusion. But it's an effective illusion, and one that makes the case for free inquiry difficult to advance on a campus like, on a campus like Middlebury's. Now, I think there's a second and related framing problem uh, that I saw in the Middlebury case um, that I also think put the defenders of the shutdown in a position of at least rhetorical strength. And that was the idea that the value at stake was freedom of speech. Now you might be surprised to hear this because after all this is a panel called uh, Speak Freely and the book's subtitle is Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech and we're here to discuss threats to free speech at Evergreen, uh, Evergreen State College and, and Middlebury College. But as those of you who've read uh, Professor Whittington's book uh, know, he maintains, correctly I think, that freedom of inquiry is the value most emphatically under threat when speakers like Charles Murray are silenced or no platformed in an academic community. And so I'll quote just very briefly from his book. The truth-seeking justification for free speech in uh, uh, emphasis, the, the, sorry, the truth uh, seeking justification for free speech emphasizes the value of open inquiry and debate to the listener, not to the speaker. When speech is suppressed, it is the community that suffers from having their intellectual world darkened. That strikes me as a crucial distinction. Um, when Jay Perini and I wrote the Middlebury Statement of Principles on free inquiry, we were careful not to frame the issue as merely a question of free speech. That's why we call the statement free inquiry on campus. Now again, this may seem intuitive uh, to you, but I promise you that it is not intuitive to many students uh, and colleagues. Professor Stanger, how many times did we hear that Charles Murray has plenty of other platforms, so why does he need to use ours? It was as if the visit was an exercise in self-expression for Charles Murray, rather than an, an attempt by students to learn something from his lecture. This made it possible to see the student protesters and Murray as two parties to a dispute. Which side are you on? Clearly the students, not the interloper. Completely obscured in this common way of thinking were the hundreds of students who came to hear Murray give a lecture, and maybe to ask him a question. We easily forget that there were about 400 students lined up outside that particular auditorium at the point that it was declared full. Very few of them were protesters. The protesters, let no one doubt their devotion, had arrived early. And this, was to say, this is to say nothing of the 200 or at least 150, I think, students inside the auditorium who did not participate in the, in the disruption. In other words, the rights violated in that auditorium were not, were not the free speech rights of Charles Murray, but the free inquiry rights of our students, rights that are theirs by virtue of their membership in an academic community. So simplifying the problem to a matter of free, free speech can conceal the inquirer after knowledge from our view, and so hobble our effort to make sound judgments about the rights and wrongs at stake. I think there is a separate, and this will be my final point, there's a separate but related uh, a problem linked to the outsized role of freedom of, of speech in the kind, the kind of discussion we're having, and it's, and it's this. Over-reliance on the abstract procedural norm of free speech allows us to avoid the need to mount a defense of a speaker as reasonable as being within the bounds of responsible opinion. This kind of substantive defense requires more courage, but I suspect it is crucial if there's to be any hope of preventing the groupthink that often grips a campus in an incident like the Battle of Murray. Now, if a student organization or a faculty member wanted to invite an actual bona fide bigot to speak on campus, I would defend their right to do so exclusively in terms of the procedural norm of free speech or open inquiry. But should we defend the appearance of Charles Murray or Amy Wax or Harvey Mansfield or Robert George? 
in exactly the same way as we defend the appearance of a bigot? Certainly not. In the run-up to the Murray talk, those who defended the right of Murray to speak on campus were courageous, and I commend them for it. But in retrospect, I can see that there was a serious flaw in the approach. With the ex exception of the woman seated to my right, their argument went something like this. I abhor everything he's ever said. I curse the ground he walks on, but I believe in free speech. As one colleague parodied this defense of Murray, he's a Nazi, but you've got to listen to him. <laughs> it's a mistake to defend a serious scholar like Murray using only the naked abstract norm of free speech. When Charles Murray, Harvey Mansfield, comes to campus, the considerations in view are not the same as those in view when Richard Spencer comes to town. We should defend reasonable dissenters as reasonable. Hadley Arcus has raised a similar concern in, in print about conserv conservatives, as he put, puts it, flying to the doctrine of, of free speech on campus, soaring to a grand moral defense of speech by detaching speech from standards of moral judgment or discrimination. Now, my own view is that on campus, standards of moral or scientific judgment to limit speech content would be quickly abused by the majority to silence reasonable dissent. But I think Arcus has a point. In most specific cases, the norm of free speech should be an auxiliary consideration. And our first step should be to consider the reasonableness of dissenting opinions and to rebuff slander, caricature, and knowingness. Defenders of free inquiry should not limit themselves to a single abstract argument, but should be prepared in specific cases to interrupt a rush to judgment against a speaker. They will not convince the propagandists, like those at Middlebury who, for example, preposterously attacked Murray as a white nationalist, a claim so silly that even the Southern Poverty Law Center quietly removed it from their website. You will not, they will not, as I say, convince the propagandists, but you may convince open-minded centrists who, in the absence of substantive counter-arguments, are inclined to believe the propaganda. And beyond any strategic value, the defense of reasonable dissent as reasonable helps to, advance, uh, to, to address the pervasive deficits in open-mindedness and intellectual humility that lie far deeper than faulty understandings of free speech. You'll notice that in identifying the difficulties of advancing a culture of open inquiry, I've said very little about students and much about professors, and perhaps that is indicative of the greatest difficulty of all. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Professor Whittington outlines in his book a shift early in the 20th century from universities as places of orthodoxy to universities as places of openness and inquiry, wherein we used to believe that we knew everything there was to know and the role of universities, the role of universities better? Yeah. The role of universities uh, was simply to share the knowledge that was already in the hands of the elders with the young. And we came to understand uh, around the turn of the 20th, 19th to the 20th century that actually we didn't know everything there was to know and that we should shift our perspectives as new information came online. And that became what universities were doing and that is the role of universities that all of us came of age into. And that is, those are the universities that we need. Universities of free and open inquiry in which minds are changed and paradigms are shifted. There was pushback though from the beginning uh, from some in the academy towards universities as openness as opposed to universities as keepers of a static truth. So I will very, very briefly uh, go over some of what happened at Evergreen. It's a years long process and it would probably take those years to tell the story completely. There was a perfect storm at this small public liberal arts college of a manipulative administration with a, a new college president, cynical faculty, and students, hardly all of them, but students who were ready for indoctrination by those faculty. A majority of people in each of those categories simply lacked courage and so did not stand up as they saw um, what was going on. What happened there is tragic. It's not too strong a word for it. The college is now failing by all metrics. Um, enrollment has plummeted. Faculty and staff are being laid off. Science programs are disappearing. Arts programs are disappearing. 
the financial, uh, financial reserves are close to zero. And it didn't have to happen. During the most public weeks of the, the madness that engulfed Evergreen in May and June of 2017, large public meetings descended into anarchy and near violence. Students and faculty were hunted on campus. Some students were assaulted, actually assaulted, by protesters, also students with nightsticks and bats. Our family and friends had concerns that those protesters would show up at our door because Brett was at the center of the protests. So we took our children, our entire family, out of the state for a few weeks. Administrators colluded with students at the heart of the protests to specifically, quote, target STEM faculty with implicit bias training and the like on the basis that scientists apparently are particularly racist. No compelling evidence, though, of any systemic racism or sexism on the campus was ever produced by anyone. And, I mean, this is, this is an incomplete list. In the middle of all of this, administration told the campus police for us to stand down. And so there was no protection for those who were actually at risk and actually being assaulted. As a result of this order, there were moments uh, during the protests when the police were barricaded, literally barricaded inside their police station on campus, and there was a sign on the door, if you need help, call 911. As I wrote to the staff and faculty during the protests, since many people on campus were keeping themselves away and so didn't know what was happening, this is not equity that is being pushed for here, and this no longer looks like a liberal arts college. Months later, after the protests had died down, the public liberal arts college that had once lauded Brett and me as two of their stellar professors invited our resignations because we refused to stop talking about what we saw as the assaults on free expression and the ideals of a liberal arts college. They promised to make our lives, our lives miserable if we stayed. They couldn't force us out because we had tenure. Um, but because we would not promise to sit down and shut up effectively, we took a settlement and we resigned. So Jonathan Haidt, who many of you in this room will be familiar with, has argued that you cannot simultaneously maximize both a pursuit of truth and a pursuit of social justice. And that is true. At schools like Princeton and Chicago, uh, Chicago as the school which has produced the most concise and remarkable set of principles to defend free expression on campuses, um, these schools have made it clear that their mission, that your mission, is the pursuit of truth. Compare that to many other schools, although Evergreen is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, Evergreen was an institution that was pedagogically experimental and remarkable. You could do a deep dive with students into learning communities that were remarkable and years long, and you could investigate dangerous and exciting ideas. But in 2011, they changed their mission statement to read, in part, Evergreen supports and benefits from a local and global commitment to social justice. This seems innocuous on its face. Not only that, it seems morally good. Right? And therefore, it seems that anyone objecting to it must be somehow on the wrong side of issues that us good people care about. And this, I would argue, is where the danger lies. People are hungry for knowledge. All of us are hungry for knowledge, at least up to a point, uh, until sometimes uh, it, is, it is taken from us, that hunger, and for ways to assess claims of truth. Epistemology is the way out, epistemology being the philosophical study of how it is that we make claims of truth and on what basis we make those claims. So my field in Brett's evolutionary biology in, involves the, a toolkit with which to assess claims. And so I, I think it no accident that we were both the ones who were, who were most vocal on our campus and the ones that the campus wanted gone at a moment when they were switching from an explicit policy of pursuit of truth to one of social justice. So I'm gonna skip forward here to, to make my comments a little shorter. Um, at university, we have the opportunity to teach students how to understand claims, how to assess them, how to make meaning of them. And different minds are gonna to gravitate to different parts of every story, right? Take, for instance, the peopling of the Americas and the fact that 30 years ago we thought that there was one cradle of civilization and now we know that there are several, that humans have multiple times and multiple places independently evolved the concept of zero and astronomy and roads and architecture 
and all sorts of other things. That is remarkable and it reveals to us our shared humanity rather than at the same time showing us how we can study differences. And different minds will be attracted to different parts of that. Some people will want to study the methods by which we can date artifacts, some people will want to study the astronomy, some the arts, some the textiles, and by studying those in a university of open inquiry, we can actually, we can actually come together and learn more. So to students, I would say, do not let anyone erect roadblocks to your acquisition of knowledge and skills. And do not let anyone tell you, we don't ask those questions here. There are dangerous questions, and there are some very ugly answers. Human history is a long series of genocides and rapes, of hostile takeovers, both brutal and subtle. Best that we understand why those things happen, so that we can help ensure that they happen less and less as we go forward. If we try to protect our sensitive ears from hearing about them, anything, from hearing about anything we find discomforting, we are more likely to repeat that history, as has been said before. Education without surprise and discomfort isn't education, it's confirmation. Confirmation of things which are true is fine, but it's kind of a waste of time. And confirmation of things which are false builds a dangerous fantasy world, a world built on fairy tales and gossamer strings. So I would like to build a short tale here and just four short anecdotes, only one of which is about Evergreen. Ah, and then pass the mic to Brett. To illustrate the slow creep of orthodoxy into higher ed, which is supposed to be a place of open inquiry. On my first day of college in 1987, so I dated myself, um, I was a literature major, and I walked into literally my first class on my first day of college to find, in my creative writing class, a list of things on the board that we would not investigate and that we would not write about. It was genres, and so some people, some fans of literary fiction may immediately sense, oh, okay, I, I also don't like genre fiction, that's okay, but imagine walking into a room on your first day of class, your first day of college, and seeing that you shall not write or engage detective fiction or science fiction or fantasy or westerns or romance or any of the other genres. I left literature shortly thereafter. It didn't seem to be a place of open inquiry where one could actually explore ideas in the ways that one wanted to. A couple of years later, in an anthropology class, on a different campus, in a class called Primate Behavior and Ecology, I walked into the very first class and saw a list of words on the board with the dictum, we will not be discussing these concepts. And they were, in fact, core concepts in evolution and animal behavior, and they still are. Sexual selection, female choice, reciprocal altruism, and on and on and on. We will not discuss these concepts. Why? Because the professor did not approve of them. And she was going to keep us, while we were pretending to learn about primate social behavior, from discussing the core concepts in the field of primate social behavior. <laughs> Two plus decades after that, I found myself, tenured professor at Evergreen, teaching a program that had a, really no political content whatsoever, vertebrate evolution. And the first day of my class, 50 students, two faculty, the first day of my class after the November 2016 election, Donald Trump had been elected, and at Evergreen, like I imagine at Princeton, and like most institutions of higher ed in the US, because of the strong liberal bias at all such institutions, the tenor in the room was one of glazed eyes and slack jaws, and I had that too. None of us quite knew what had happened and why it had happened. And so I invited, after my class ended, any students who wanted to stay, to stay for a discussion of, of what was going on. And fully 40 of my 50 students sacrificed their, their lunch hours, stayed through, we went right to lab in the afternoon from, from a two hour discussion of, of what we all thought was going on. And one thing that I said to them was, do not imagine that nameless and faceless racists and sexists in other parts of the country have elected Trump to be our president. Instead, think about the conversations that you have not had, but perhaps wanted to have, or the things that you did not say in conversations that you were having on this very campus. Consider the self-censoring that you have undoubtedly engaged in yourselves. And the response was remarkable. 
Afterwards, several of my students came up to me, many of them in tears, to tell me their own stories. Again, this is anecdote, but one of them had lost a campus job for speaking a, uh, an opinion that was not politically correct enough. Several of them had lost friend groups. And all of them, not that it should matter, were left of center. They weren't left of center enough to fit the dogma of the day. Finally, and this is the trickiest to say in this room, uh, yesterday evening, Brett and I were fortunate enough to be walking around Princeton on our, on our first night here, and we wandered into Labyrinth Books, a beautiful, independent bookstore that uh, the likes of which I love. I, I wander into independent bookstores whenever I can. The pro-social justice bent of Labyrinth Books was quickly apparent, and perhaps what I expected, although I was slightly disappointed by the, the way that they were placed all in the front of the store with, with nothing else, really. And then I went looking for the science books. And I found them tucked away on the lower level behind all the course books on a couple of shelves, poorly curated, falling over. Not very many of them. And I thought, this sends a very clear message. And maybe there are three other independent bookstores ringing Princeton's campus, and some of them have more science books in them. <laughs> Sounds like maybe not. Um, if, if not, what does this, this, this sends a pretty clear message to those of us who go looking, but it sends maybe a more important and powerful message to those who don't know to look. There are a few books of a scientific nature in the new releases section right in the front as you walk in, but very little else. And that tells those who are interested in, in the truth that is found in books that science is not what you found, find there. And that is alarming. So from a prescription against particular approaches to fiction, which I saw on my very first day of college, to a prescription against fundamental concepts in the fields of biology and animal behavior, which I saw in that anthropology class, to the self-editing that happens on campuses uh, among friend groups that I've heard from from my students for years now and specifically heard on that first day of class after the 2016 election, to a curation away from science. All of this suggests a move towards an orthodoxy that isn't good for us and it isn't good for free inquiry. Perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, before I begin my comments, can I just ask, show of hands, how many people feel they were reasonably well-versed in the story of what happened at Evergreen on walking into this room today? Oh. Like maybe half, okay. So, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to limit myself to three points that I think are important. The first one, I keep being invited to talk on the subject of free speech on college campuses all over the U.S. and elsewhere. I think free speech is the wrong framework to be thinking about this and that it has very little to do with college campuses. I'm not going to go deeply into why, if you want to know my various reasons, you can look up uh, my congressional testimony in which I made these points on a panel with Alison Stanger and Robbie George. Um, but I do want to highlight one here. What happened at Evergreen that caused it to become a national story was that an unstoppable force met an immovable object. Now, it happens that I was the immovable object for the moment. Let's just chalk that up to a personality defect. But the point is, Immo uh, unstoppable force meets immovable object is an interesting story, okay? That's a key to why people know about Evergreen at this point. But um, immovable objects are vanishingly rare in an academic context for various reasons. One, if you're going to do it on the faculty side, you really need to have tenure. And in order to get tenure, a lot of the things that you have to do train you not to be an immovable object. So there are very few immovable objects on college campuses. And that's a problem. Um, absent an immovable object at Evergreen, what would have happened is students would have protested. That would be the word for it. Rioted is what actually happened. Administrators would have made concessions. And that would have been a story like dog bites man, just not worth reporting, right? 
So, in short, campus bullies would have intimidated the entire population into leaving Evergreen or self-censoring. And the point is, self-censoring isn't really a free speech issue exactly. It's not actionable. So, to the extent that the mechanism of action here involves intimidation, and that the consequence of that intimidation is people deciding to voluntarily leave or not say things that they would otherwise say, that's not a free speech issue, that's a deeper issue. And so we have to learn to address it um, in that context. Um, even with the immovable object meeting the unstoppable force, there was a massive miscalculation on the part of the protesters and rioters that was also necessary for the story to become interesting and public which is that they filmed their attempted struggle session with me and proudly put it online. I, I cannot emphasize enough how big a role this played. Those images shocked people. It shocked almost everybody who was not already familiar with the confrontation with Nicholas Christakis or Jordan Peterson. People who had seen video of those confrontations saw something very familiar. People who had not seen video of those confrontations saw something brand new and quite scary. So those things combined to make Evergreen an interesting enough story for it to become uh, national. The second point I want to make has to do with why I stood up and whether I was right to do it. And this is a difficult one for me. I stood up for three reasons. One is I felt an obligation to do it. I knew it was the right thing to do, but a lot of people knew that. Heather knew that. She happened to be on sabbatical, so I was at the eye of the storm uh, while she was to the side of it, although we were in complete agreement about the necessity of it happening. Two, I am particularly troubled by manipulative bullies. So that's the personality defect in question that made it impossible for me to do anything else. Um, <clears throat> And three, I thought that I was positioned to endure and repel the accusation that I absolutely knew was going to come back. Why did I think I was well positioned? Well, I had tenure. I was well liked by students of every description who knew me very well because of the way that Evergreen functioned and knew that I was not a bigot. I thought that would protect me. My own personal history was also completely inconsistent with the claim that I am a racist. So I knew that I was going to be accused of that, but I thought I could endure it. Here's the part that's really tough for me. I was wrong. The thing that allowed me to endure the challenge of the phony equity and inclusion forces was that they were unable to keep the story in-house. What altered the course of that story was Sam Harris, my brother Eric Weinstein, Dave Rubin, and Joe Rogan each of whom had a significant audience that they then took the video that the protesters themselves had posted and amplified it and broadcast it. And so if there's one thing you take out of my remarks today, it is that there is a principle that applies to institutions like colleges and universities that you should remember at the highest level. And it's going to sound familiar from a very different context. It is PV equals NRT. Okay, that's the ideal gas law. What Joe Rogan, Eric Weinstein, Dave Rubin, and Sam Harris did was they turned up the heat and they added pressure. And that caused the vessel to explode. And when it did, my story became public and survival became a possibility because outside eyes were able to view what was taking place. And in reviewing it, the answer became obvious. I was not a racist, something else was going on. So the third point I want to make um, is that many will tell you that what happened at Evergreen, yes, it went too far. What happened at Middlebury was obviously extremely unfortunate, but these are isolated examples and it's being blown out of proportion. That is incorrect. What is taking place is actually a threat to the Republic, and it is a threat to the Republic in one of two ways. The first possible failure mode is that some sort of a Maoist takeover could escape the colleges and universities, and it could actually affect not only the nation, but if uh, other nations don't manage to repel these same forces, it could take over the West and it could be a threat to the West. I find this unlikely in part because the Second Amendment has created a substantial bias in who has the actual firepower. <laughs> but what I do find very frightening is the possibility 
that the self-censorship is going to cause colleges and universities to fail in their mission to educate people how to think about difficult issues. If that happens, if the next generation of people to take over power in the West does not know how to think, Western civilization will come apart and it will be replaced in the way that civilizations before it have been. So I would urge you, don't think about this as a free speech issue, don't think about it as a college campus issue, and don't think about it as a few isolated examples that are probably not that serious. None of those things are correct. What we face is a very dire problem. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so our panelists have done a great job of uh, being sh brief, and as a consequence, we have uh, lots of time for questions. I believe we have a roving microphone um, to handle the questions and record for posterity. Um, uh, so please uh, wait until you uh, get a mic, um, and let me open the floor to y'all. Questions, perhaps from a student in particular. Over there. Uh, hi there, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. I appreciate your bringing up the perspective that we all sort of need and we as students don't get. Um, my father is a professor of mathematics at Knox College. It's a smaller liberal arts college that is a pretty liberal biased, which is fine. It's academia. But he shares a lot of the concerns that I think you, peop uh, you as academics do. And I think we as students sort of miss out on your perspective. So generally speaking, what would you like us as students to do to preserve free speech and free inquiry? I can start. It's a great question. I think it's really easy. Just love learning and insist on thinking for yourself and encourage others to do the same because so much of this is an astonishing degree of groupthink. I mean, that was what was most unsettling and startling to me at Middlebury uh, was the extent to which people with PhDs were willing to say Charles Murray is a, is a white supremacist because the Southern Poverty Law Center says so. And they acknowledged that they hadn't read anything he'd written. They didn't have to because somebody said that. Now think that through logically when you're not thinking for yourself. Let's go back in time to a little thought experiment, experiment 1938. Nazi Germany. Do you think people were walking around saying, gee, the Jews are really intelligent? You know, there are a lot of things being said about Jews in 1938, and if you just said, okay, well, so-and-so is saying the Jews are this, you see what you get. So I think so much of the problem stems back to this lazy, intellectually lazy approach to thinking through important issues. But I think I'm optimistic about where this is going because it is boring to be ideological. It is boring to be predictable. It might seem safe and, you know, for any first years coming here, you know, you're extraordinary to get in. It's impossible to get into Princeton and the admissions office encourages you to think of yourself as some unique tile in an identity mosaic. I think that's enormously damaging, not because you're not wonderfully talented, but because if you come in thinking that the reason you're here is this particular identity that got you there, you will miss out on an education. Because education is transformative. You've gotta be willing to challenge your accepted beliefs. You might come out at the end of it thinking the exact same things, but you're going to be in a different place than where you started. So I don't think this is very hard. I think it just requires a little bit of courage on the part of individuals. We can all play a role about what's exciting what education requires, what it means to be a decent human being. I mean, every major, well, this, that would be a huge generalization, but think about it. Uh, take Christianity, for example. You want to show me anywhere in the New Testament where it says you're supposed to hate your neighbor? It just, it just isn't there. So a lot of this is actually common sense and people just have to be willing to stand up and say, this doesn't make sense to me. And hopefully there are gonna be professors that are supportive. So the other thing you can do is take our classes. 
I'll just yeah. add one, one thing to that. That's uh, very helpful, uh, Professor Sanger. Um, well, so two, two concrete um, suggestions. One would be to seek out talks that you think you might disagree with. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of talks at Princeton. Uh, seek out the ones you think you might disagree with and go to those. Um, secondly, um, to the extent that it ever comes up, um, feel free to tell your professors that, that, that you don't need them to protect you from difficult ideas. Thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then the third point is a, more, is a more general point, not a sort of concrete action point, which is, um, as I, I think as I suggested, um, my own view is that the problem really is uh, more a problem um, of, the of the faculty and not the students. So I think that the, the standard uh, account of snowflake students who are demanding, I actually think that's probably not right, um, or not the, not the primary explanation of what's going on. I think it is a problem with the faculty. So, so I think that's some, a way of saying you didn't cause the problem, but you could, you could find ways to, to, to make things better. <coughs> I would say um, this isn't necessarily an academic response, but for individuals, I totally agree that this is more on the faculty side than the student side in terms of what is happening on campuses right now. But for students who are looking to make themselves as robust and resilient and anti-fragile as possible, uh, seek friends who don't share your history. <clears throat> travel and travel while taking as few of the comforts of home as possible with you so that you actually engage the ways that other humans on this planet live. And, and this will sound maybe the farthest afield, develop skills, hobbies that are physical in nature, not just social. So that the physical universe has an opportunity to give you feedback that you can't game with uh, social manipulation. So either sport or woodworking, uh, you know, any, any number of things wherein you get the feedback that tells you you are improving or you're not. And, and you know at the end of the day whether or not you're, you're making progress. You move from a framework where you've done that and then you engage with ideas and you have a better sense of actually how to tell whether or not you or the person you're talking to are making sense. And if I could add just a couple things here. I actually disagree with a little bit uh, with what Allison said. I think it should be easy, but I don't think it is. And I don't think it is because of the fact that humans are exquisitely sensitive for very good evolutionary reasons. We are exquisitely sensitive to being excluded from a group. I mean, that's effectively fatal for our hunter-gatherer. So we detect the signals that we are being pushed to the fringe and we very naturally act in our own self-protection by doing whatever is necessary to rejoin. So what I would argue is that you exist in a very large population. If you take up the habit, um, the rationality community actually coined a term for this it's called steel manning. Um, the IDW has borrowed it, but steel manning basically means that you phrase, you do your best to present the argument of those who disagree with you so well that they recognize you as having done it right. Okay? It's not an easy job, I promise, but if you develop that skill, it will serve you for the rest of your life. If you do it out of habit, certain people will reject you. They're doing you a favor. Right? They're telling you to seek higher quality people who will not reject you for doing it. <laughs> so understand, some of the things that are hard in life will cost you friends, but the quality of your friend group will be upgraded by the process. It's very painful. It's easy for me to say, but it's very painful when it happens. But if you'll just trust that this process will result in people that are the right, they're the people that you want to find yourself around when things get really serious, then you'll be glad you've done it. Right here in the middle. Uh, I'd like to add a thought as well, um, which is that I think every student here and every faculty member here at Princeton and at other schools should take a look at the course curriculums that are offered by every college, including this college. Because if you do so, I think you'll find the course curriculums are very biased. And if you're at an institution that isn't offering a breadth of courses, you cannot get a good education. So I'll give you just a few examples. If you look at the music curriculum at Princeton, 
you will find it wanting. You'll find a heavy bias towards certain types of courses. You'll find that the major chamber group here is African drumming. Not classical chamber music, but African drumming. You'll find that there's two classes in hip hop, but none in Bach or Beethoven or Shostakovich or Stravinsky. So if you take that and you look across the courses that are being offered at this school, I would um, um, argue that it is very hard to get a good liberal arts education because you can't get a good liberal arts, arts education if you don't have those courses offered to you. You'll find that there's not a good course in civics at this school. There's not a good course in the Bill of Rights at this school. There's not a good course in many things at the Woodrow Wilson School. If you look at the Wilson School, of which I'm a graduate from many, many years ago, you'll see a very heavy bias here. So when you leave this school, you are not necessarily prepared to be um, active in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the, political, in the uh, sociological sphere, um, based on a good grounding it, of where the world is really at. So if you're a student at this school or at any school, I would urge you to look at the curricula at the school and go to the university and say, why aren't these courses being offered to me? It's one of the people who teaches civil liberties in this school. I, I object to the claim that we don't teach the Bill of Rights well. I, I teach it very well. But, um, but certainly it's the case that I think as students you need to take an active role in your own education, including um, trying to find classes that are of interest and, and will expand your knowledge and build um, on it in useful ways. And of course there's a limitation as to how much you can do that if the, fa if the courses aren't um, available. And there's certainly a responsibility on the faculty's uh, part um, to make available um, a good range of, of classes. But, but as students you also want to be um, uh, thinking yourself about um, what classes to take and, and what's going to serve you um, best. Um, so I know there are more hands up uh, while I go. So right up there. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a, a very interesting conversation so far. My question concerns a bit of the, the, the optics at both uh, Evergreen and, and Middlebury. Uh, clearly at Evergreen, the video played a, a very big role, right? And the optics at Middlebury may be maybe less clear, so I want to offer you a, a thought experiment to see whether uh, it would have made any difference at all in terms of how, the, how Charles Murray was invited to the campus and how the uh, stage was set up for his presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to just give it some thought uh, as to whether it would have made any difference at all in terms of how the, the student body reacted if it were positioned as a speech by Allison Stanger on why the bell curve is shoddy science with a rebuttal by Charles Murray. In other words, by putting Murray on a platform featuring Murray, and even though you were, I assume, very well prepared to challenge it, it was, Murray, it, wa it wasn't set up like a presidential debate where you've got two podiums and they're relatively equal. It was really, Murray is being positioned in the center and we've got some questions to ask him. If that were flipped around, would it have made any difference at all as one way to understand or feel what the dynamic was emotionally on the campus? Thank you. I think that's such a cool thought experiment uh, but I would have to respond that I would not have been able to participate in such an event because I actually believe that most social science is shoddy science. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> when I hear people saying Charles Murray is engaged in shoddy science, I feel like saying, I, can I show you a few other instances of shoddy science? Just about every piece of social science has somebody else saying this is shoddy science. So I don't find that a very compelling uh, frame if you will, I wouldn't have been able to participate. But maybe someone else could. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, uh, 
I, uh, I, I think you're right as a, as a sort of strategic matter that probably, um, yeah, that's a reasonable uh, uh, counterfactual. Uh, the protest might not have happened if they had set it up that way. But I actually would regard that approach as a sort of appeasement. Um, uh, the idea that conservatives need babysitters when they come to campus, that they need someone to respond to them, um, but then you can bring uh, people with the right, with you know, right-thinking people, and they don't need a response, right? Um, this is not a place where we want to find ourselves, I think. Yeah, I would. I would also say, I, if your thought experiment is correct, I would find it troubling. And to the extent that there is some truth, I don't like to say it. I, I have many millennial friends, and I don't like the term. But to the extent that there is truth in the term snowflake, it has to do with the fact that very subtle shifts in optics, which don't necessarily indicate anything, carry great importance. And I, I remember as a college student myself at Penn, uh, Louis Farrakhan came to speak. You know, he was a well-known anti-Semite. I certainly went to hear him speak. Uh, I was not injured in the process. Uh, and I would say, look, um, it, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of anti-fragility, uh, from Nassim Taleb, you should get familiar. An anti-fragile system is one that grows stronger rather than weaker from challenge. You want to be anti-fragile to the extent that there are perspectives that you will find challenging. Maybe they're wrong, maybe they're horrifying, but the ability to sit through them and figure out what's wrong with them is good for you. So stop being so sensitive about the way something is presented or whether or not the counterpoint is going to be made on that stage go and you know i always used to enjoy the process if there if the if the right challenge was not going to be leveled at a speaker i leveled it in the q a right and it's, it's a skill you can develop it and it's well worth doing so right two rooms up yeah hi so thank you for being here just to give um i guess the room some context i'm a first year um, PhD student in the history department at Princeton, and I graduated from Middlebury College in 2017. So I was a student when the Charles Murray protest happened, and to give you a little more positionality, I helped organize the protests. So I'm here, I disagree with most of you, but I'm here to listen to what you have to say, and I heard you. And I guess, Professor Stangler, thank you for your account of the events, but to give you a little bit of sense, I guess, of my context, um, and what my experience of the events were. And I'm happy to talk to anyone after this about and tell you more and give you more information because I, I want to keep this short. Um, there was a lot of work done by students, um, me included, to talk to the American Enterprise Institute, so the students that invited Charles Murray to our campus, to talk to them about what their motivations were for doing that. This is all before the event happened. So it was announced to us about six or seven days, so the AEI planned for this event to happen, I'd say a month or so in advance, but it was announced to the college campus a week before, and a bunch of students had read the bell curve, um, were working on reading the new book. Um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the argument for students that in, were involved, or faculty that were involved in the protest was that we hadn't read Charles Murray. I spent a weekend um, before he was to come reading about 300 pages of what he'd written, so I'd say, I gave it a shot, um, and we spent some time talking to our peers from the American Enterprise Institute Club, asking them sort of what they were thinking, bringing him in, why, going back to your question about the thought experiment, why they did it the way they did it, not because we wanted to be appeased, but just sort of wondering what the motivations were, and it be became pretty apparent to me at least, and this is a matter of opinion, that it was in the name of freedom of inquiry or freedom of speech, the conversation was, was a provocation as much as it was anything else. And that is, again, an opinion that you can disagree with. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about sort of why we have reached a head or a binary, like you were mentioning, Professor Callanan, between freedom of inquiry and inclusion. And I think that creating that binaristic division and a lot of what happened at Middlebury misses a lot of context. So I would argue that a lot of the reason we are exploding in terms of this issue on college campuses and I think this is coming to the place it has come to. There is a lot of, and I am, I'm training to be a historian. I'm training to teach history. I'd argue there is a lot of context. I have my own opinion of what that context is, but I'm curious as to why you think we've got to this point, to sort of like 
historically. This is this is just great. I think it's wonderful that you're here, and I'm I'm I'd be interested to talk to in talking with you afterwards. I, I don't th I don't think it, I've written about this. I don't think it's any mystery how we got got to that point, and the events that at Middlebury are very much. And, and I might be criticized on this, but I think it's very much tied to the aftermath of Trump's election as president, which I think helped people to, in a sense, lose their minds in terms of thinking about how best to resist Trumpism. Because that's the saddest thing about what happened at Middlebury, is students did things that weren't in their interest and actually brought about the very opposite of what they were trying to accomplish. So to me, that's a big takeaway to think about and something that I've been trying to encourage when, when I speak about this around the country, I always say, you know, the, the emotions were real and I understand them. Uh, okay, I'm getting distracted by you, but that's all right. Uh, the emotions are real and we have to validate them, but I think the interesting question then becomes, <coughs> all right, you feel that way. That's terrible. How can we make Middlebury a better place for you? What concrete steps could be taken to address these feelings? And that's a very different than just dealing with the emotions. And I think a lot of what happened at Middlebury had people reacting emotionally rather than thinking, reasoning about how we get to a better situation both in this country and at the college. And we, we could debate about that but, that, but that would be my response. So I have a, I'm a scientist, I have a hypothesis um, that I think I've never spoken about, about how we got here. Uh, and it has to do with developmental environments, which I find to be the missing element in so many conversations about human beings and what takes place with them. There is a peculiar feature of um, conversations in social media space. And social media space isn't new. Uh, there have been chat groups for decades, but as a dominant force in one's upbringing, they are new. And what I've noticed as a participant is that there are certain things that unfold in these groups that actually require honorable mobbing in order to deal with. In other words, if you're in an evolution discussion group and a young earth creationist decides to disrupt your discussion with the insistence that the earth is 6,000 years old, in some sense, you have a right to drive them out so that you can have a conversation about things that are substantive. And there's no normal mechanism for doing it other than people sort of teaming up and saying, yeah, that's beyond the pale, it doesn't belong in this group. And so what I think I've seen is people translating that behavior into physical space where it does not belong, where other things actually take precedence and, and govern these systems, and so basically, it's just the inappropriate application of a correct developmental lesson to an environment in which it doesn't belong. That's the hypothesis. So I would add, um, each of these warrants its own tome. But um, I don't, Trump didn't help, but I don't think anything started with, with that election. Uh, I think the rise of cell phones with cameras such that suddenly there was documentation possible of the actual inequities and injustices on the streets uh, and the racial profiling and actual police brutality that does happen on the streets in the US uh, contributed uh, starting in the mid 2000s uh, because suddenly people who knew at an analytical level could now see at a visceral level what kinds of inequities were happening that contributed. Uh, going back a little farther, helicopter parenting, uh, such that children are completely protected from all harm, and physical harm is conflated with mental harm, is conflated with emotional harm. The rise of pharmaceuticals for uh, low-grade or non-existent uh, syndromes. There are certainly many syndromes that do exist for which pharmaceuticals are warranted, but giving children speed and anti-anxiety meds such that when they grow up, they do not have full control of their emotions contributed. And then uh, add to that mix social media, which means that people are not connecting face to face. 
uh, even as much as we are now here, um, but are feeling connected uh, electronically and yet not as often connecting uh, in real space and meat space. I think all of those things contributed significantly to the sort of perfect storm uh, in the last few years. And uh, incidentally, um, most of those topics are discussed in the new Haidt and Lukianov book, which is terrific, The Coddling of the American Mind, which I recommend if you're interested in, in those topics. Just swing over this side of the room. Over here. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, the extreme one-sidedness uh, of the uh, faculties on elite college campuses in terms of their uh, viewpoints, the lack of viewpoint uh, diversity here, and if you think that uh, something positive could uh, be done uh, about it. Jonathan Haidt, who uh, has a, a, a new group, uh, in, he runs uh, out of uh, NYU uh, uh, on heterodoxy, uh, took an informal poll of a thousand social psychologists at a, uh, an annual meeting of social psychologists, and he asks, uh, uh, can you please uh, raise your hand uh, when, if, if, if you are a conservative, a liberal, a socialist, or libertarian, tell us which one. And of a thousand, three raised their hand when he said conservative. And I can uh, speak from experience. When I was a student here many, many years ago, and the politics department as a graduate student, I was the only out of the closet Ronald Reagan supporter uh, in either the politics department or the Woodrow Wilson School. I will say though, to answer what uh, this uh, uh, woman uh, said, that uh, Princeton has uh, changed considerably and particularly with the James Madison program, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, course offerings uh, for people who, let's say, have more traditional views here. But my basic question here is, uh, is there anything that can be done to enhance viewpoint diversity uh, among uh, the faculty? And uh, I certainly would not support something like an affirmative action for libertarians or conservatives or religious people, but at least it seems to me important to get the message out to graduate students that people who hold right of center views are welcomed uh, and uh, encouraged. Uh, I, several years ago, I was asked uh, to write a, a uh, a piece uh, for a conservative publication uh, that required me to, in, uh, to interview several uh, students at Princeton, including graduate students, and some of them said, well, the atmosphere at Princeton isn't bad, but I don't let anyone, when I'm on the job market, know that uh, I'm religious or I'm conservative because I fear that uh, I won't get a job if uh, I do that. What can be done in your view? Uh, first of all, is that a problem? Uh, and if it is, uh, is there any uh, uh, solutions that you might uh, recommend? Someone else want to go first? I'm always going first, so I'll <laughs> let someone else go. Sure, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, hi Russ, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, I guess uh, I, I'd be inclined to say that, uh, that um, target of opportunity hiring is not uh, something uh, that should be off the table. Um, that is, um, you know, looking, uh, elite institutions, looking to find, um, uh, you can call this affirmative action for conservatives if you like, but um, looking to find conservatives who are underemployed, who would be qualified for, to, to work at that institution and trying to, and trying to hire them away. Um, and um, uh, and I, don't, I, don't, you know, I, don't, I don't think that the, uh, the reason to, do, to, to consider doing something like that is, is, is sort of, um, you know, uh, for the sake of distributive justice for conservatives or, you know, uh, because I think there's some uh, grave wrong been done to conservatives. It's because um, I guess I'd like to think it would make these, the place, these places more interesting, you know? Wouldn't it be interesting, you know, to have someone next door who, who thought that there was a natural law, you know? <laughs> um, you, could, you could talk to them about that. Um, uh, you know, I, I confess I'm a conservative uh, under the age of 70 at Middlebury. Uh, and um, in the social sciences and humanities, there's a few hiding in the hard sciences. But um, I think I get to have all the fun because uh, I have lots of people who, who, with whom I can disagree and from whom I can learn. And we can learn from people who, with whom we agree, but we can learn in unique ways from people with whom we disagree um, on matters of first importance. So uh, you know, I think, I think it's doable. Um, the, the response that, uh, that one often gets to that, that kind of proposal is that um, there aren't enough. 
in the pipeline. You know, there aren't enough conservatives in the pipeline, if we, even if we tried to do this. And that's why there's not enough, because well, it's well, well, right, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Economics 101, um, you know, if you, if you, uh, uh, the, 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 the supply would rise to, to meet demand, um, I think. Uh, so that would be a good problem to have, I think. I would, I would just echo everything Keegan has said and add that I think we would all do well to seek excellence in those who are unlike us. I think it's a natural human tendency to, you want to replicate yourself, so when you talk about what's excellent, it's often someone who's like you. If we could just broaden that out to realize that we're all going to create better organizations, better educational experiences, you know, better living experiences if we actively seek out those with whom we disagree and those who might be different, different than us and see the excellence in them. We would address a lot of country, uh, problems, not just in the academy, but in our country. Um, I think the absence of conservatives from academia is actually a very terrible problem but I'm concerned that the solution to it falls into this sort of classic liberal blind spot. So the classic liberal blind spot sees the advantage to solution making, but it doesn't understand the unintended consequences of it. And I'm concerned that if you um, recognize the seriousness of this problem and then you go about attempting to solve it by importing conservatives, that, that you will um, you'll create a whole new set of issues that are, are just as bad. And so what I would say is, first place to go is to think about why this bias exists. And partially it has to do with what, what Dr. Stanger is saying about people replicating themselves. And so there's sort of a positive feedback of liberalism in certain places. Um, there's also an economic question, which is that professors are sort of a uh, a weird corner of the working class, or at least they have been in recent history, and that working class has traditionally been uh, a liberal bastion. And so this is now uh, a little bit incoherent as the Democratic Party has more or less abandoned the interests of working people in favor of symbolism, and so it isn't exactly clear why left and right break down the way they do, but um, in any case, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It is natural for people to politically align with those who represent their interests. And to the extent that economic interests have driven here, that is in part explanatory. And so as, as those factors change, it may change the demographics of the academy too. Uh, I thank you all for being here. I have two questions. The first one will be addressed to the entire panel. And is, uh, <clears throat> uh, some of you mentioned earlier that Jonathan Haidt has been talking about, about the campus orthodoxy and about how some of the US in, uh, institutions has been dedicating itself to first the freedom of inquiry and the pursuit of truth, while the others have been dedicating his commitment to social justice. Uh, now, Princeton, I think, has found itself in a strange area of having a good commitment to both the freedom of speech, as you can see, how President Eisenhower has uh, chosen to speak freely as the pre-read for the incoming class this year. And at the same time, I think Princeton also has a great deal of commitment to social justice and diversity on this campus. Um, now, do any of you think these two cultures are necessarily in conflict with each, o each other? And my second question is, that is to uh, Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, is that how prevalent or harmful do you think this um, orthodoxy of viewpoints is in the natural sciences, uh, specifically in the physical sciences, and do you think it is um, becoming more apparent or more damaging um, to the natural sciences? Thank you. You all want to start? Sir? I'll take your second question first. Um, as, as you indicated, this is less, there's less homogeneity of political affiliation in the hard sciences than in the social sciences and humanities, uh, but it's still very left-leaning. Um, the, the social justice machinations are less obvious in the hard sciences, but mostly, I think, as a result of scientists trying to just keep their heads down and ignore it. And so, <clears throat> what we saw directly at Evergreen was among the scientists, 
we got a lot of private support, uh, but almost no one stood up. And so you have, uh, I think the, the harder the science, the less connected it is to human endeavor, the more likely you are to have more conservatives, not because physical endeavors are inherently a conservative thing, uh, but just because there is more freedom to have your politics disassociated from your intellectual endeavors. However, there is one way in particular that uh, this is creeping into science departments and schools of science, which is that uh, we are hearing from several institutions that sometimes when, for instance, a chemist is going to be hired, instead of hiring a chemist, something called a chemist educator is hired in their stead. And chemist educators, chemistry educators, come out of schools of education. They don't come out of schools of natural sciences. They aren't, in fact, people who are generating and testing hypotheses. They are people who are basically trained in the methods and thinking of social justice and in education rather than in science. So as that continues to happen, we're going to have a dilution of actual scientists in science departments. And that is going to be a big problem. I would just uh, emphasize one thing that Heather said, which has to do with the closer you get to humans, the bigger the problem is in the sciences. And so in some ways, there's a reason they came for us. And it's because evolutionary biologists who think about human beings are a problem for the simple story that many on the left naively would like to tell. You know, if you say something about men and women being the same, sorry, no go. Right? That's just, it's almost too simple to deal with that particular assertion and point out why it's not true. Um, now, I don't think there's anything dire in why it's not true. I think the answer to what is true is perfectly fascinating. And it's been our history that teaching it to students has not caused a problem. So I don't think there's anything to fear in it. But if you want to sell a simple story that says, Males and females are the same to the extent that we see any difference in how they behave or are employed in the world that is the result of some sort of barrier. Well, no, that's not going to fly. And so in, in some sense, you just not, you know, you can deal with quarks pretty safely, right? Quarks is less controversial than uh, human nature. And so, it, yes, it's a problem in the sciences, more so here than there, um, but that's, that's the pattern you should expect. I think your question is, is very important, and, and uh, uh, your first question, uh, your second question is important too. But the, the question of whether, as I understand, uh, understand it, a, 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 a truth-seeking mission is in competition with a, a mission of social justice, um, and I, th I think it requires, you know, a, a fuller answer would take take more time. But I'd say on the most um, basic level, um, they are in conflict. Um, Inasmuch as um, uh, one finds um, the social justice mission uh, causing students and faculty to regard certain questions as off limits, because um, those questions are seen as um, uh, uh, questions that are out of step with, you know, uh, assumptions about their their some assumptions about what social justice is. I mean, another way to put it would be to say the reason that these two cultures can be in competition with one another is that um, there's an assumption that I know what social justice is. Now, if the question of what is justice, um, if the question of what is justice is, is, is posed, then actually we're, we're, we're doing the truth-seeking thing. Yeah. Um, so I think this is the way to bring them together. Um, but, but, um, but certainly in practice at, uh, at many or even most elite colleges uh, and universities, I think that they are in competition. Ke Keegan has said this quite, quite well, this whole idea of them being in conflict when certain questions cannot be asked. I think no more needs to be added to that. I would just say in response to the, the question about the sciences that I've had a different experience in speaking around the country on these issues in finding enormous support in the nat natural sciences for free inquiry. Because you can't do real science without free inquiry. 
All right, thanks. So I think that largely uh, exhausts our time. I appreciate you all coming for a very interesting discussion. I hope you will help me uh, thank the panelists for doing it.